just to, to help us with the reminders that we need. Um, there's going to be a grief group <laughs> that is kicking off. Uh, Ted Stagner is going to be leading that group. If, uh, and it's a group for working through grief for whatever reasons. If you want to be part of that, get in touch with him. Um, I'm not going to read you the phone number and the uh, email because you wouldn't remember it, but the, you can get it from the church office or if you have a church directory. It's Communion Sunday. If you're home and you want to participate, this would be a good time to go get those elements. And so now, let's stand and worship because God is in control. He's here whether we feel like everything is out of control or not.
Please be seated. Let's pray. Lord, um, we are grateful that we live in a nation that, that is free. Um, we've done some things that they are kind of ugly in that name of freedom. Forgive us for that. Help us to help us to learn again how to respect each other, how to love each other how to cherish the very things that you've given us in this land. Um, Lord, there are specific requests. There are, there are things on the hearts of each of us here. Um, there are concerns, there are losses, um, there are vague things that we're all, all dealing with. Um, but we join together with, with the family of Ralph Keller pray for the extraordinary comfort that they need right now. Um, it's hard to lose someone. Um, we pray for Grace and for Doug as they're separated from each other while Grace is recovering. It's hard to be separated. And you know that. And you know how to bring the comfort that, um, and that we need and that we often don't understand. Um, please bring healing in so many ways. Remind us daily that you really are in control even when it seems like the world is, is spinning in, a, in an incredible way. And we are grateful for that. And because of that, we can pray together the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So at this time, if you're online, you, this is a chance for you to, uh, to place your offering. Um, again, there's an offering basket at the back for those of you who are here. Um, and now listen and enjoy to this music.
Am I on? Am I on? Is it on? Is it on? Okay. 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 All right. All right. We're, we're today we're going to the last in the series on here. Uh, next week, I decide I'm going to preach to myself. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm stressed. So, I, I, this is, next week is rest of the stress. We're going to look at Matthew 11, uh, 28 uh, to 30. I'm stressed out, man. This is long, less, long enough. Um, anyway, we're going to do... Um, today, last one here, we're going to go back to the verse I mentioned on week one from the Jonah message. Uh, it's the one verse, first John 4, 18. Uh, and it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. And I've read that verse lots of times, and it always puzzled me. How in the world does love uh, overcome fear? And if it's perfect love that drives out fear, and I fear that then my love is not yet perfected. And if it's not yet perfected, how can I then work on that love? So my uh, grasp of love, or the grip of love in my heart, will give me the strength to face my fears that are diminished. So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at, again, well, the first half will be like a reminder to us. How does love conquer and help us overcome fear? And then we're going to look at, well, then how do I grow in fear so that love grips my heart more than fear does? As a result, I can kind of overcome my fear. That's what we're going to look at. Now, you might say, you know, he's, he's one day on his first week on the job as a senior pastor, and we're only getting one verse? He's already cutting back on us. Wow. <laughs> But I, I, I'll make up for it another Sunday, maybe 50 verses, but one verse for today. All right. In the case you missed it, I'll do it again. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. Lord, help us now to grasp, to help us to understand how love really helps us overcome fear, and Lord, help us to become perfected in that love so we do have the, the strength, we have the ability to be loose, be free from our fears. Show us, we pray in Jesus' name. And, God's, and all God's people prayed. All right, a little review. First, uh, John says, love is the antidote to fear. Love is the ultimate antidote. Well, how is that possible? Well, in two ways. Love does cuts kind of two ways. First, as we become more grounded and grounded in God's love, when God's love really kind of grips our heart, when we really drill down on it, we will feel more secure. And as a result, being feeling more secure, we, are, we will find the power to uh, face our fears and our fears will become less and less. I love this one proverb. It, it always helped me with my own fears. For the waywardness of the simple, this is in Proverbs 1, 32 to 33, for the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. And I love that last phrase. I like the, the imagery of it. It's like being in an easy chair. To be at ease without fear of harm. And are you at that place yet in your life? Well, what's a proverb? A proverb is distilled wisdom. It is observations about this life made over millennia, a period, and it, these are kind of truisms, but they're just generally true. They are the norm, but they have to be tempered by something we talked about before, that we live in a Genesis 3 world, where what should happen doesn't always happen. There is the norm, but the norm sometimes doesn't always occur. Normally, we live in safety. Normally, we, we live harm-free lives. I don't know about you. Think of all the times in your life where you experienced danger. Danger to the degree that you were harmed by that. And I think about my own life. I, I had my uh, car keys and wallet stolen one time out of my locker, but it really didn't hurt me. It wasn't harmed by it. Uh, I got My car was hit while I was in the grocery store, but I wasn't in the car, so I wasn't harmed. I faced cancer, and that was, could be harmful. I faced a tornado, faced a hurricane, uh, but none of those, in the end result, though I faced them, I wasn't harmed by any of them. And I'm 58 now. So am I just lucky, or is this proverb pretty true? That the norm is we live pretty safe lives. I think it's safe to say that this proverb is true, though, again, the norm doesn't always happen. We live in a world where 
creation is broken, we, there are bad people who do bad things, so it's possible to experience harm. Now, in light of that reality, knowing what Scripture says, um, uh, we have a choice. We can either focus on the norm and be at ease, or we can focus on the outlier and live in fear. It's a really choice to him. And interestingly enough, uh, more than likely, what we fear just does not happen. Most things, they say about 95% of the things we fear actually never happen. So you really can be at ease with the fear of harm. I mean, if it's going to come, it's going to come. So you might as well deal with it when it comes and don't fret about it until it actually occurs. That's one way I think we can live at ease without fear of harm. It's living in the light of the reality that God is with me. Uh, he's the great I am. And that one, what, the end of that song. Um, he will see me through it. And if I'm going to face hard times, I'm going to face hard times, and I'll face it when it actually happens, instead of fearing it all the time. At the same time, I can take precautions. I mean, it's a wise thing not to put yourself in, in you know, a dangerous situation. It's probably a smart thing to put locks on your doors. If you want, you can have an alarm system. That's, that's fine. It's good to lower the possibility or, or probability of harm. <laughs> And if you do suddenly feel insecure, and sometimes I think all of us at times just get this creepy feeling, like the, the air, the, the, your hairs at the end of your back of your neck kind of stand up when you are kind of hit by fear, it's good to remind ourselves that God is with us. He's here. And remember what Scripture has to say. Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us, how will he also, not also, along with him, graciously give us all things. Basically, Paul said, hey, God helped us face our greatest fear, death, hell, and the grave. He can help us uh, face our lesser fears. I love the Psalm 27 one. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And I love that, like that, just the imagery. The Lord is my stronghold. Is the Lord your stronghold? The more and more we become anchored in Him, uh, the stronger and stronger He will have a hold on our hearts and lives, and lesser and lesser will fear grip us. We will be able to overcome our fear. Now you do have to face them. As a reminder, you have to face your fear. You don't want to run from them. Uh, courage is not the lack of fear, but it is simply facing our fears no matter how we feel. Uh, I have a fear of heights. I don't like them, but that does not keep me, nor did it keep me, from going to the top of the Space Needle and looking over the edge, or the top of the Empire State Building, or going on the highest and fastest roller coasters. I love roller coasters, but every time I start going that first hill, I say to myself, what were you thinking? All right? As I'm slowly going to the top, what were you thinking? And when I finally go over the first hill, I'm fine. That's the way you can, you, can have, you can experience fear, but still face them so that they don't rule your life. You can overcome them. But it happens every time. I think one of the reasons I have struggled with fear, and I find as I've counseled people, one of the reasons people struggle with fear versus others seem to not struggle with them is the, the lack of having a kind of a loving, nurturing family. I wasn't surrounded by a uh, strong father figure who I could— who had a you know, sense of strength, this is incredible love, I was surrounded by it. I didn't have either parent, really, weren't very nurturing. My father was harsh, so I feared him. I, I feared doing something wrong because if I did something wrong, you get punished for it very quickly. So I understand this connection between 1 John 4, 18 and fear, because there is a connection between, uh, uh, what were they thinking about? I, there is a you know, connection between love and fear. Um, or fear and, and punishment. Uh, people who approach God from a religious perspective, and if that's you, if you try to approach God and deal with your fear from a religious perspective or approach, uh, your fears will not be diminished. They'll actually grow. And I experienced this as well. The first, like, half of my Christian life, I thought I was, you know, following what my faith had to say, but I actually was approaching God from a religious perspective. I thought... The more good you did, the better you become, the better Christian you became, the more you prayed, the more you go to church, you do all the things you're supposed to do to grow in your faith. 
that nothing bad would happen to you. And when bad things happened to me, I thought, well, I must be doing something wrong. Maybe I'm not praying hard enough. Or maybe I don't know how to pray. So I took courses on praise. I read books on prayers. I read methods of prayers. And I tried every method you could think of on how to pray. But, but still bad things happen. So what does it mean? Maybe I need to worship harder. Maybe I need to uh, get the 12 disciplines and do all of them all at one time. Or uh, maybe I'm not sincere enough. Or, and, and I did the same thing that Jonas, the sailors in Jonas' story did. First, they, they prayed to their idols and they didn't work. So they grabbed more people. Maybe we got to pray more intensely or more harder, get more people to pray. Let's get some more idols. Uh, let's try this God. Let's try that God. They don't really matter which God it was. They just wanted something or someone to get, get them out of this mess. And when it didn't happen, they get more and more intense in their faith. And I did the same thing as well. A lot of people do. You get more and more intense in your faith. And the more intense you get, you realize over time just how bad you are. And you start concluding like, like uh, Job did that if blessings really are the result of my moral and religious performance, then I'm doomed. You know, uh, the proverbial shoe's going to drop sometime because God's going to punish me for all the bad things that I've done. When I realized salvation was not by works, but by grace, that thing changed. When you have a personal relationship with God, when you know that God loves you and he's gave his life for you, if you can internalize it, if you realize blessings are not because of your, uh, your great moral performance, but they're a result of God's grace, and the fact that we have a loving Father, our God is a loving Father. And He has big arms. When you grasp that, you feel way more secure because, you know, it's not what you do, what He has done for you. It's not all your failures that are weighing on you. You're released from them because you're perfected in Him. You're righteous in Him. You have a loving Father who watches over you. As a result, I became more secure and less fearful which is what we need to weave into our consciousness. We need to weave into our consciousness uh, the reality of God's love. We have a huge father with huge arms that are tender, who watches over us. It doesn't mean we won't face hardships. It doesn't mean we won't experience fear. But I think the, if you grasp the love of God, it helps kind of tamp that down so it doesn't rage inside you like, like a fire, like it just fires up your imagination. You can tamp that down. I think a good illustration is marriage. Uh, the longer and longer you are married, the more and more you realize your spouse loves you. And as you grasp the level of love, it enables you to do what every night? Go to bed and close your eyes without one eye open. <laughs> All right? You, you're able to sleep because you know the person right next to you loves you and they would never harm you. And does that describe your relationship? Or when it, do you keep your one eye open? If so, you need to come and see me, okay? <laughs> now, the reason why we can sleep is because we are secure in that love. And the same thing is true about God. If we're secure in His love, if you rest in it, you can be at ease without fear of harm because you know your, your God, God next to you, loves you. Um, second way that love tamps down fear um, is, is with us. Um, I heard someone say that the opposite of fear is love. Now, I was always told the opposite of love is uh, indifference. Uh, if, if love, if, if, even anger, anger is a sign of love because you're not indifferent about the person. You're, they still upset you. They still affect you emotionally. Indifference is you don't really care. So I always learned the opposite of love is indifference. But one person mentioned, no, that you know, the opposite of love is fear and opposite of fear of love. And it's true in one way, in one aspect. And that is when you're fearful, you get incredibly self-centered. You get self-absorbed. I mean, something threatens you. Something good that you, that you love and that you need find security in, it is threatened. And when that is threatened, you become fearful. You become incredibly focused on either the object of fear or yourself. Yourself is threatened. But when you love someone, love becomes selfless. When you really love someone, when you're gripped by that love, you want to serve them. You want to do some nice things uh, for them. Uh, it takes the, your mind off yourself. So in that way, um, I think love helps conquer fear. Again, the example last week, the, the noise in the night. It, just, it happened to us again last night. Noise in the night. Right? 
You got to go out and face that. You can either stay under the covers and stay under the bed, uh, or you can face it. What will help you face it is the fact that you love your spouse, you love your children. That it takes your mind off your being threatened or being harmed, or that's a burglar or that's a ghost, and you, you put your mind on your loved ones, and that motivates you. That actually conquers your fear. So love does conquer fear. So when you experience fear, just what you need to do is get your mind off yourself. Get your mind off the thing that is scaring you and onto something else because you become what you focus on. I mean, if you're dieting and all you're thinking about is food and not going to the fridge, you're going to fall to the fridge because you, you are but what you focus on. Uh, if I were to go on, uh, going on the roller coaster before I got in the roller coaster, I kept face, if I kept saying to myself, I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall, I'm not going to get on the roller coaster. I'm not going to face that fear. Uh, instead, I'll be constantly fearful of heights if I keep focusing on falling. But if, I, but if I focus on the enjoyment of my children and how fun this is going to be, or as I'm going up the hill, I enjoy nature and the beauty of God's creation and keep my mind off what I fear, I can conquer it. I can get through it. Uh, now, how now? This is the new part. This is, you get paid, now I'm getting paid what I'm supposed to do this week, because now I'm giving you new stuff now. Uh, how then, how do we grow in love? If perfect love... Uh, triumphs overcomes fear, and I still fear, it means I have, I have room to work on in this area. How do we grow in love? Uh, you grow in life by gazing upon God, by seeing Him, uh, seeing Him in Jesus, seeing Him in Scripture. Um, in Scripture, um, there's a parallel between the fruit of the Spirit and holiness. They actually refer to the same thing. They both point to God's character. In Romans 6, Paul contrasts the works of the flesh with holiness. In Galatians 5, he contrasts the works of the flesh to the fruit of the Spirit, which will tell you that holiness and the fruit of the Spirit point to the same thing. So how do you develop the fruit of the Spirit in your life? You do it by gazing on it, by seeing it, seeing it modeled in other people's lives, seeing it modeled in God's life. I've uh, read a lot of books. You know, like, you see, I had like, twice that number of books. I got read a lot of them. I've read a lot of books in my life and a lot of titles that in essence say, hey, if you've got troubles, here's, get this book, do these things, five things to live in the victorious Christian life. And then there's tons of those. And the, the solution to problems are, it's all about doing something. It's about activity. Uh, they're like Christian self-help books. Uh, just do all this method, uh, and you'll be fine. Uh, but, it, but I don't think it really works. Uh, you, you grow in love not by doing things. It's more about who you are as a person. It's more about your state of being, not about doing. Uh, Jesus said, uh, it's actually both in the Old and the New Testament, so it's not just an Old Testament thing. It's in Leviticus, but also it's quoted in Peter. Be holy which means be like me, grow in the fruit of the Spirit, become more and more Christ-like. Why? Uh, because you have problems? No, that's what Jesus said. He says, be holy because I am holy. I am. If you want to be holy, if you want to be like me, look at me. See my example. Soak it in. Again, you become what you focus on. Now, we have a modern word for this. We call it... Uh, uh, the reason why we are who we are is because more than likely we saw things modeled for us repeatedly. We were surrounded by it. As a result, it, it felt like that's just the norm. This is how you normally respond to things. Uh, I, I, I find war and wars tend to come from families who worry a lot. Their parents worry or their mother worry. Uh, I find people who are very stoic and are unflappable came from very stoic homes. Others who were surrounded by parents who were manic and depressive tend to struggle with their emotions going up and down. Uh, I know in my house, it was, it was filled with anger. So for a long time, I, I struggled with my temper because I was surrounded by it. That's all I saw. This is how you respond to times when you're frustrated or when you think your kids aren't listening. You rage, you yell, you scream. <laughs> it doesn't work. You, know, you, know, you, you actually... You become what you focus on, what you're surrounded by, what you see model. It's much easier to become. How did Isaiah become holy? He says in Isaiah 6, 
I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted. His response was, what was me? I'm running, for I'm a man of unclean lips. And notice this, this next part. And I live among the people of unclean clean lips. Everyone swears. It's all I hear. So it's easy to let it fly, you see. <laughs> and my eyes have seen the king. What caused him to change, to reform in his life, to grow in this area, he saw the Lord. My eyes have seen the king. How did Job become holy? Job said, my ears have heard of you talking to God, but now my eyes have seen you. I've had all the theology, all the self-help books, all the Christian devotions in my life. My theology is good. I know things about, about God, but that didn't change him. He didn't change until he saw the Lord. I have seen you. Even he's encountered God. You see this in Peter in Luke chapter 5. Uh, uh, they were a bunch, bunch of guys fishing. fishing. One day they were catching me all night. They're tired of running from home. Jesus said, hey, relaunch. And he said, you're crazy. You don't know how to fish. Do it anyway. They did it. They caught a bunch of fish. And Peter responds this way. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. What changed him? Not information about Jesus. Jesus can help you catch great fish. And here's five steps to do it. He saw. He saw. He grasped it. And it changed his life. So it's not about methodology. It's not about five steps to victory. It's not about activity. It's about having an encounter with God that, that reaches down inside your soul so you grasp who he is. It seems the cross. And that demonstration of God's love for you and internalizing it, pulling in, saying to yourself, that was for me, because he loved me. Paul makes the same point in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. It's the love chapter. And it's interesting how it begins. Uh, at the beginning, Paul tells us how important one is. The reason why it's so important is it's the hallmark of the Christian life. It is what distinguishes us from everyone else. If you want to know if you're a Christian, all you have to ask yourself, am I a loving person? Here's what Paul says. If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would be only a noisy gong and a clanging symbol. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all, the, all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith, I could move mountains. How many of you want to do that? Read that passage and you try to get that done. Right? But I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. What is Paul saying in this first part of the He says, This is the hope of Christian life. This is how you know if you're a Christian or not. And it's not by any of the six things that are not signs of a Christian. He mentions tongues, he mentions prophecy, he mentions word of knowledge or knowledge, he mentions faith, giving, even martyrdom. I mean, why would he say these things? No, first, what are these things? If you read Romans 12 or 1 Corinthians 12, uh, you know that these are the gifts of the Spirit. These are things we do. Um, now, Paul's not knocking them, but he's pointing to a reality about them, and that is all of them can be counterfeit. He knew that himself. In his day, they were called the mystery religions, and every one of those mystery religions had all of these. Uh, and we know all religions, all Christian religions, actually have all these in their practice and in their beliefs. And every religion has produced martyrs. So how do you know if you're a believer? Paul says, it's not a matter about tongues or prophecy or doing great things for God or evangelism, or it's not about being busy. It's not about doing a lot of things for God. It's about who you are. And is the hallmark of your life, the more and more you grow closer to God, are you becoming more loving or more harsh? And Paul says it should make you more loving. And it should be more Christ-like. Jesus says something even more astonishing. I find it troubling when I first it. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, and we cast out demons in your name, we performed miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. 
the, the phrase Lord, Lord, now anytime a word is, is repeated in the New Testament, it's, it's, a, it, it's an emphasis, it's an intensity. These people are intense. They are sold out for Jesus. Uh, but they're, they're proof. The way, the way they're proof for it. They need heaven. They deserve God's blessing was all that they did for him. They prophesied. They cast out demons. They did the miraculous things. All these are the gifts of the Spirit. And yet Jesus said, I never knew you. He didn't say, I knew you a long time ago, but you backslid. No, he said, I never uh, knew you. And what Paul is saying to us, and what Jesus is saying to us, the sign that you are Christian is not all the good things, that list of things you, you give him, that all the things you've done for him, the real sign of authentic faith is your character. Are you more Christ-like? Are you like him? Are you loving? Do you have all the fruits of the Spirit or don't you? Not that any of us are perfect in all of them, and some of them will, some of them will lag in life, but are they all emerging? Are you growing in that direction? We grow in love again, not through activity, not through self-help books, not through methodology, not Pastor Richard's 10 steps to victory. Well, I'm putting it out next week. Buy it next week, buy that. It's $14.99 on Amazon. <laughs> it's not that we should do these things either. Not, not in those as well. Those are legitimate. They're in Scripture. If God gives them to you, you should exercise them. But they, they're, they're not an end to themselves. They're actually the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit. It's to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Um, all the all things we do for God are not a spiritual portfolio where we show God as to why he should reward us for heaven, heal us, answer our prayers, give us a blessed life. You grow not by activity, you grow by seeing, gazing. And are you gazing? Do you see him? A great book you should read and follow is Richard Foster's book, Spiritual Disciplines. It's a good book, but I hate the title. Because it, it reminds me, discipline, for me, the image is going to the gym. Now, I go to the gym like six times a week, right? But I don't want to go. I don't enjoy going because I know it's going to be painful. And, and it's not a fun thing, but I grind it out anyway because I know it's good for me. But the spiritual disciplines are not like that. It's not like going to the gym and grinding it out. They are actually two ways to gain. God in encountering Him. You can't do through prayer and meditation and worship and service and all sorts of lots of other ways. Another good book is C.S. Lewis's book, uh, The Four Loves. Great, great, great book. So, how, how are you growing? Are you growing in your love? Now, before you answer that question, am I growing in my love? It's important to know what you about the fruit of the Spirit. You're doing right, right? Um, that is the word fruit of spirit is singular. In, in English, fruit can be either plural or singular. But in Greek, they, they have two different words. One is plural and the singular. Paul uses the singular word here, which is interesting. Um, what he's saying is there's not multiple fruits of the spirit. There's all of these are one fruit. And they're all aspects of one fruit. And they're all to grow in our lives simultaneously. They emerge simultaneously. If you're a loving person, you will also be, and you probably say, yeah, that's true. You should be a patient person. You should be a joyful person. You should be a kind person. You should be a good person, faithful, gentle. You should have control of your temper. You should have some form of self-control. A loving person does all of these things. And if you're a person who has self-control, you also should have patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. Uh, now, you don't... All of each one of those, you don't have to be a Christian to demonstrate those. Uh, non-believers, you know, have some of those in their lives. But the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is in a Christian life, all of them emerge. You should see all of them growing. It's like one of those trees. I don't know if they're real or not, but this a tree that grows apples, oranges, and pears. Somewhat because they graft it all in, and they all grow simultaneously. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's how it grows. Uh, picture the fruit of the Spirit as a diamond, and, and each, each time you turn it, you see a little different aspect of the diamond, that's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is a diamond, and all those other things that are mentioned about the fruits are different aspects of that same diamond. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you growing in love? To say that is, are all the fruits of the Spirit emerging in your life? 
Are you less terrible today than you were last year? Are you less anxious today than you were last year? Are you more patient today than you were last year? Are you more joyful? Uh, are you more at peace? Now I'm not saying if you answer yes to those that you're not a Christian, but it is kind of a warning flag. It would mean we have room to grow in this area of our lives. And you grow by seeing them model, by experiencing them, seeing them in scripture, seeing them in Jesus, uh, seeing them through other people's lives. I think it's part of why we're part of the church, part of the body of Christ. We make the word flesh. When we're surrounded by people of love, I think, that, I think we, we experience God's love best through each other. And when we, I experience this unconditional, radical love job by another person, it touches you, it changes you. If, if you see it, see it in a movie, it, it touches you. You see the heroine give their life for something, it drills it in. You grow by seeing, by being surrounded. Remember, uh, I think it was, it was Job. No, Isaiah, I'm surrounded by people who curse all the time, so I curse. If we're surrounded by people who experience the spirit, we'll see it and we, it will become more part of life because it become what you focus on. Now, lastly, uh, something else you got to know, and that is um, there's something we can do actually to put our love on steroids and put nitro uh, into our love. In, in, uh, it's a result of understanding the economics of love. Uh, Andrew, economics. I'm going to talk about economics right now. Okay. The economics of love. I'm guessing that most of you here, when you started out in your life, weren't independently wealthy. And because you weren't independently wealthy, you had to do what? You got to get a job. You got to go to work. You can't spend all your time at home. Now, do you want to spend all your time at home? No. Well, okay. No, no. No, well. You want you have a family, you know you need to spend time with them, but you know because you're living financially, you, you can't be philanthropic with your love. Uh, it's limited. You only have so much time you can give because you have to work. You're not independently wealthy. But if you were independently wealthy, you can give a whole lot more of your life and time to others. Because you don't know. You don't have to go to work. Now, if you do have to go to work, it means you have to limit the amount of time you give to others, because you only have so much. You can't give it all away, or you're not going to eat. You know? You're not going to provide for your family. And uh, now, what is true for Nancy is also true of our love. Uh, we all need love. Babies need love. They, they discover that babies aren't loved, they die. We need love. But we only have so much love to give. You cannot give, 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 give yourself without receiving. Um, you, you have to receive. Now, there may be some people in your life that you can do that for a short period of time, but all of us ultimately need people in our lives who can read from the love tank. Uh, we need a source of love. Initially, it came from our parents, but then uh, that only goes so far. And if you didn't have loving parents, you, you, you leave that house uh, not really being able to give you some love as easy as those, as those who were nurtured in a very loving family. Um, but we go looking for relationships, people who we can both express love and also receive love because all of us have kind of a limited ability to love. It has to be replenished. You cannot be philanthropic with your love because you only have so much to give. Unless you have a infinite source of love in your life. Uh, and as a Christian, we do. We do have a source of infinite love that we can tap into. And that's the love of God. Paul says love never fails. What does he mean by that? It means it'll never collapse. Well, but I know my love class. I know my love is overwhelming. I know sometimes I get tapped out. But if you're tapping, he says, into God's love, into God's infinite source, you have an infinite source available to you that you can tap into. All you need to do is to tap into it. And you will find the ability to love more deeply, much, much more thoroughly. You have so much more of yourself. Well, how do you do that? How do you tap into that source of love? The fruit of the Spirit, it's, a, it's of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Those things will emerge in your life, including love, as you're in the Spirit. You have to have the Spirit of God in your life. It's a work of God in your life. It's not a, a, a human doing. It's a work of God in your life. And that happens as you're in your faith in Christ. 
you, you say, you know what, you stop trying to save yourself. You stop trying to do good, good enough to earn his love, earn his acceptance, earn his blessing. Realize you can't. You don't have to either. It's not about moral religious It's what he has done for you. It's simply accepting his offer of salvation by grace. Seeing what Jesus did to you on the cross, he paid it all. All to him I owe. Now, we are saved by grace. And grace alone. And if you grasp that, if you accept his offer by saying, Jesus, come into my life. Lord, save me. Lord, fill me. He will. He will come. He will give you his spirit. And that spirit gives you access into this infinite source of God's incredible love. And have you come to it. If not, I, I encourage you to pray. Now, I would say a little prayer. We can all pray together or pray or follow me in prayer. Um, it's not magical. You don't have to. You just say, Jesus, come into my life. That's all it takes. But if, if you don't know how to articulate or wondering, I need some words to help me with this, just pray along with me. Uh, in fact, everyone pray after me. Jesus, come into my life. I want you. I can't love the way I want to. I need you. I accept your salvation. I believe in Jesus and the message that I am forgiven. All my sins. I am cleansed. I am set free from my old sinful nature. And I have a new nature that can tap into the infant supply of my love. Lord, I tap into it today. Fill me in Jesus' name. Maybe some of you need to retap. Maybe be reignited. Say, Lord, fill me again. Lord, fill me again. And as he does, you will discover you can tap into this infant source of love, which will enable you to love. And as you love, you forget about yourself. And you'll, be, you'll feel this incredible security in God's loving arms which will make you strong in life and will enable you to increase and conquer. For the way of the simple will kill them, and the places of the fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fearing God. Lord, help us to really arrive at that point in our lives that we are so certain that we love, like we're certain of the love of our spouse, the love of our children, that it makes us incredibly at ease. We no longer keep an eye open, but we can sleep at ease. Bring us to that mess. Help us to tap into, first grasp it, tap into it. Rid up ourselves. Stop focusing on the object of fear and focus on our heart. He has a big, large, love of tender arms. He keeps us safe. He watches all this. Help us to grasp it. Pray in Jesus' name. If you're out there online, this is the time we're going to have to come together. Uh, if you're in here, in the, in the room, go ahead and kind of prepare the kit. Now, I find that it's easier to just pop it off completely and then put the cup down and have someone else hold it and then pick the parts I cannot feel that top part off until I put the whole thing on. So, go ahead and prepare those and then we'll do it. And as you go, I'll offer prayer. Lord, we thank you for this Lord's Supper. It is a physical, we see this, we see, we see it physically done. Uh, we see it instituted. It's reenacted. So we see, we see what your love is. We see what you've done for us. And when we see the blood, the bread broken, we remind you, your body was broken for us. Your heart was broken for us. Uh, you were broken forth because you love us as a demonstration of your love. Your love was shed because of the love of us. You truly gave it all for us because you love us. And if you're willing to do that to save us, if you're willing to do that to, to fix our worst fear and our worst enemy, death, hell, and grave, then we know you're big enough and loving enough to help us face it. 
help us. On the night when the Lord was ready for bread, the heaven given things he broke it, saying, This is my body broken for you. Do this in the numbers of me. In the same manner, after the meal, he took the cup. I mean, this is the cup of the New Testament. Poured out in my blood for your forgiveness. Do this as often as you drink it. In the numbers of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death to you. You proclaim the means. He loves me. Rest in it. The body of our Lord will be for you. Take it easy. His blood shed for you. I love you. Take and drink. Now let's stand and say, close our worship service for the time of this worship. We thank you, God, for your incredible love for us. And the strength to give us to overcome our fear.
time being, we have to still do the virtual grabbing the hands. <laughs> so we want to do our virtual hands. Uh, go ahead and uh, at home, you're, you're safe at home. So uh, Jesus said, peace be to you. My peace I give to you. Not the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let them be afraid. 